the first two or three rows, I think that would be the reading of it. So if you guys can move close, that would really help out a lot. Thank you. Guys, in the back, move closer to please. Thank you. <coughs> nice. Is that better? <laughs> Good. Okay. Can, can everyone hear me? Good. Okay. So, moving on, um, I want to touch on a couple of really key elements here, and then we'll go into the practicums. So the first thing we're going to do is a stress profile. Okay? I'm going to teach you how you, got, you run a psychophysiological stress profile, and then we're going to break into groups, and you're going to practice with each other. Because okay? the key element in any learning is repetition. So I want you to repeat it, and repeat it, and repeat it, until you no longer like it, and then we'll repeat it some more. All right? So it's ingrained. All right? So this, this, t this um, assessment is going to be very, very useful for you with your clients and stress because it's going to help you understand how they react to stress, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how they react to stress and how you can uh, do uh, design a better intervention protocol for them, okay? Now, continuing on the trauma track, <coughs> there are four key elements to trauma. And most of your clients are going to present those four elements at one point or another, okay? So there's four key elements to trauma that take place always, and they all happen. They don't happen in the same sequence or at the same time, but they do occur, and they will occur. And we're, the first one is hyperarousal, constriction, dissociation, and freezing, better called helplessness. Okay? And it's very important that you learn how to identify them with your clients because they can hinder the intervention. So if you're working with a client and they make good progress to a point, so let's say you do 10 sessions and they're doing wonderfully and they're moving along pretty well, you're meeting the objectives and the client is really changing and by the 10th session they get stuck and there's no more progress and no matter what you try regardless of what you try the client gets stuck okay it could be because of these characteristics so it's very important to understand now understanding them will help you will give you a better idea of what to start using and when to start using it it's not always appropriate to start with HRV. Even though I start with HRV with every client, sometimes it's not the right track. Sometimes I start with brain spotting, okay? Uh, sometimes it's not wise or um, useful to start with neurofeedback. <coughs> you will need to start with biofeedback or psychotherapy, and then you integrate it. So understanding these four dynamics and how they interplay and how they affect the client will help you be, be become um, more keen to the needs of your client more uh, and more understanding on how you do a, 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 an optimal intervention, okay? So, let's talk about them. Hyperarousal means that the client is stuck in a vicious cycle of anxiety and fretting and overthinking. So, what in essence it means is that the client is always expecting something bad to happen. And the client is always vigilant. It's not only hyper aroused, but it's hyper vigilant. It, he's, he or she is scanning the environment looking for threats, looking for bad things to happen. So this is the client with 
high levels of anxiety. So a lot of your anxiety clients will present with hyperarousal hypervigilance. And what happens is that the, the traumas get encapsulated, okay? So normally what happens with a trauma We have a brain here, and this is the neocortex, right? So the neocortex is the part of the brain that allows us to speak to each other, to design buildings, to design planes so I can get here instead of a boat, you know, to design technology like neurofeedback so we can help our clients. Now, most therapies, talk therapies, will operate at a cortical level. The problem is, or the difference is, that the trauma will get encapsulated in the deep brain. So we've got a mammalian brain, a reptilian brain, and this is where trauma gets encapsulated. So if we're using a neocortical intervention, we're not going to be able to get into the deep brain and extract the trauma. Now you have your amygdala and your anterior cingular cortex, which are the areas that normally get activated. So in people with hyperarousal or, hyper or hypervigilance, it is the anterior cingular cortex that is the most active. And it creates a, a, a closed loop with your limbic system and your amygdala where the information is just circulating inside all the time. And it's the same message over and over and over again. Something that's gonna happen. It is my fault. I deserved it. I'm never going to, to get better. I was a victim. Uh, you know, and every other kind of thought that goes into the person's head. What do we do in the interventions such as brain spotting or neurofeedback or biofeedback? Well, we go into deep brain and open those capsules. And we need to let the trauma flow out. Because it is not until we release the energy that the trauma is not resolved. So when you talk from a cortical perspective, you're helping, but you're helping to a point. Because talking is relieving the trauma. And in a way, it's re-traumatizing our victim. But it doesn't resolve because we're not going deep into the brain, we're not opening up the capsules, and we're not taking the trauma. Right? So we need to get there and extract it from the root, get it out, so it, there's, there, there can be some resolution to the trauma. Okay? So hyperarousal is that loop. Now, there's some, some um, studies that I can share with you. And what I'll do is I'll create a folder with all the um, the literature for what we're talking about here, I'll send it to Paul and Paul can send it to you guys, right? Normally, the, the network is T6 to FZ. So, T6 is not diagnostic specific, but it correlates with Asperger, it correlates with anxiety, and it correlates with PTSD. But there's a network that goes from T6, which is your posterior temporal lobe, you know, Broadman area 39, 22, 40, FZ, your Broadman area 32, that creates that anxiety loop. So sometimes a protocol that I use in those cases is an FZ or CC to T6. What do I downtrain? Whatever the EE shows me. What do I uptrain? Whatever the EEG shows me. Right? Now, I don't always go by the EEG. Sometimes I go with my gut instinct and my clinical experience. Okay, it's very important that you do that. But T6, FC, ZC is a very important network for hyperarousal. So a, a CC to T6 protocol can be very useful for those folks. folks. And um, alpha theta can be useful too, but you, you cannot do alpha theta with everyone. Are you familiar with alpha theta neurofeedback? The Penniston protocol? We'll talk about it. So that's a good protocol. So how does it manifest? Increased heartbeat, shallow and fast breathing, Tense muscles, low peripheral temperature, increased skin conductance, or lower skin conductance. If you're measuring somebody's GSR, galvanic skin response, and you see no response, it could mean that they're dissociated. There's deep trauma. So it could both it could go both ways, either too high or no response. Okay? Uh, cognitive rumination, fretting. So a thought enters your head and you go over and over and over again. Anger, impulsiveness, and anxiety. So the more intensive and repetitive the traumatic event is, the higher the hyperarousal. The more hypervigilant the person is. 
and this is for people who have had several traumas or have been repeatedly and systematically traumatized over and over again. Okay? So because the the anterior single cortex is involved, it could it could be comorbid with symptoms for OCD. Because it's you're repeating and you're obsessing. Uh, and a, a woman client that I'm treating now has that. She's upsetting and repeating over and over again. She was invited to um, a holiday trip over the weekend. And she texted me saying, but what if I die in a car accident? My daughter will not have a mom. And what if things go wrong? So, you know, the trauma causes of things. And she was sexually assaulted at three different times in her life. And so, you know, you, you start drawing a correlation and connecting with things, right? So whenever we talk about a condition, we have to talk comorbidity. There's always something else going on. OCD goes hand in hand with a lot of things. Depression often goes hand in hand with anxiety. ADHD goes hand in hand with anxiety or sleep disorder. So we have to look at those things. But looking at the networks will give us a better idea, okay? The second one is constriction. And constriction simply means the person is withholding the symptoms. They're not talking about it. They don't want to do anything about it. So the trauma is encapsulated and is it's it's going with them wherever they go. And it's the client who says, you know, I don't want to talk about it. I'm over it. I'm 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 doing well, really, I'm fine. But their behaviors and their reactions tells us otherwise. We know by observing their the way they interact with us that they're not okay. And so they're constricting. And why are they constricting? Because it's painful for them to talk about it. Many uh, of the people that I see in my clinic have gone to therapy before, and they don't want to go back to therapy, especially the trauma clients, because they say therapy didn't do anything for me. It made me worse. Now, what I explain to them is that it's not the therapy that made it worse. It's the brain not being flexible enough and the, 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 the therapy not reaching deep enough into the brain for, for the encapsulation, for the capsules to be opened up. So with, with neurofeedback, we can go into the deep brain, we can open those capsules, and we can help the person move on. And so it's, it's, it's in a way, it's really good for us because it's less threatening. You know, the idea of psychotherapy for a trauma client is very scary, it's very frightening because they don't want to talk about it because every time they talk about it, they're being re-traumatized. They're relieving the event, but they're not getting any resolution, any deep resolution. Now, if we do a deep resolution, well, we do neurofeedback plus psychotherapy. That's even better than one or the other. So it's very important that we help those people because you will notice, or at least it happens to me, that when I have clients with constriction, unless, they re unless they're able to move forward, the neurofeedback is not really effective. Because their brain is not flexible. And if the brain is not flexible enough, then the neurofeedback is not gonna do it. As much as we want to, it's not gonna do it. Now, how do we reach flexibility? Well, we can do neurofeedback, but exercise does help, nutrition does help, you know, psychotherapy does help. So the more that we can offer the client, the better. This is a very important one, dissociation. Because you will see it more often than not. And sometimes you will know when your client is dissociated. And clients will dissociate during the neurofeedback session. They will. Now, dissociation means it's a form of spaciness or a disruption in the continuity of the felt sense. It means it's a, it's a distortion of time and space. The person, the client, will go into their own world and we'll stay there. It's like they go into their very own dimension. Okay. Now, dissociation is a form of maladaptive homeostasis, which means they're doing it because they want to avoid the physical and emotional and psychological pain that comes from remembering the experience. So, dissociating helps you. It helps you detach from those experiences and the very pain that they cause. But they keep you constricted. When you dissociate, you're constricting because you're keeping the, the you're keeping the energy inside of you. And so that's why they go hand in hand. 
So helping break the dissociation is very, very, very important. And sometimes it's important because there, there comes to a point where many clients will not know when they're dissociating. They will dissociate and they will not know it's happening. You can see it, but they don't know. So it's very important. Flat effect, lack of empathy, feeling disconnected from the world, and it's a mirror neural system issue. So the mirror neural system is engaged and dysregulated. And it goes with depersonalization. Do you know what that is? Depersonalized is when the person feels they're out of their own body. So for a lot of trauma people, the, the main description is, I feel like my soul was stolen. They feel out of their body. So dissociation and depersonalization go hand in hand. And it's not until you break that that you can have a successful uh, treatment outcome. So as much as you try to heal the person with whatever means you use, including neurofeedback, we need to break the, the, the dissociation and depersonalization because that's the main hindrance to our, to, our, to our work. So the first thing, more often than not, that you will need to target is a dissociation. Before you target the hyperarousal, before you target the constriction, before you target the helplessness, is the dissociation. Because unless you can help the person connect with the world, and the here and the now, nothing's gonna happen for them. And a lot of people dissociate by default, they can do it automatically. You know, they can do it upon command. Uh, I'm not gonna think about this anymore, and they go into their own little space, and nothing is being affected. And you can be telling them, great job, good job at bringing the beta down and you're bringing the alpha down and look at your breathing and they're looking at you but you know they're not there with you. They're staring at you but their mind is somewhere else. And the, and the, you know, the EEG might look very good, look great, nothing's happening. Okay, so we need to take that. And the other one is helplessness. And this one is really important because this is the point where the client goes, there's nothing I can do. There's no cure for me. I'm going to be crazy for the rest of my life. I'm going to die like this. I deserve it. It happened to me because I'm a bad person. I'm being punished. Those are the typical labels that a client with helplessness will use. Will use. And when I, when I see trauma clients and I look at the EEGs and I see the particular signature, I go, you, f you think it's your fault, right? Yeah. You think you deserve it, right? Yeah. You think you're being punished? And so what we do is when we mobilize them, we empower them. So they no longer have to feel their fault. They, they feel there's a solution. And when I do brain spotting and neurofeedback, a lot of my clients tell me, for the first time in many years, you have given me the hope that there's healing, that I can heal. That's very, very powerful, especially with intractable um, trauma. So, you know, the, they're, in a, they're in prison. The client feels they're in prison. And it's a life sentence for them. And they're never going to get out of the prison. But there is hope. And understanding how those four dynamics interact and present at any given time is very important. Otherwise, you can do all, you, have, you can have all the good intentions and you can put your heart out there. But unless we understand how they, they um, affect the client, we're not going to have successful intervention at That's very, that's very important. And that has to do with something called the oriented response which means the client will always turn their attention to stimuli that reminds them of the traumatic event. They're going to gravitate and fluctuate and orient to anything that reminds them of the trauma. Which seems ironic, right? Because if, you, if, we're, if they're trying to get away from the trauma, why go to the trauma? Well, it's very simple because that's the, main, the, the way their brain was programmed and conditioned after the event. So, is the woman who is promiscuous and is always having sex with guys who remind her of her first bad boyfriend, but she seeks the same type of guy over and over and over again. Or the client who drowns themselves in alcohol, or watch pornography, or gamble their money away. You know, any behavior that reminds them and keeps them in that loop. So 
So the orienting response is very important. It's very important to identify what your client is orienting to with respect to the trauma. What are the behaviors that are keeping the trauma going? Because we have to break that cycle. And it's very important that you identify those. Could be one, could be several. Okay, and it could be anything from alcohol to drugs to gambling to to violence to self harm, self cutting, anything like that. So they're being on a constant lookout for the tiger, for that predator. That threat is no longer there. Physical. In their minds, it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's, it, it's, it creates a lot of suffering. Okay? And it's important to think from the perspective that how many people in Taiwan, Colombia, the United States, anywhere in the world, how many people are suffering in silence because of those things? And they're not getting the help that we can provide them. So the more you, the more versed and versatile and trained you become in trauma, you're going to be better professionals for it. Because that's the backbone of many of the things that we do. So what does trauma look like in the brain? All right. So this is a female sexual assault victim with diffuse high beta, diffuse fast, fast alpha. Okay. When we do QEG analysis, you will learn to see because right now that looks all the same to you, right? So I know those lines look the same. You know, well, where's the beta? Where's the alpha? Don't worry about it. I just want to give you the basics. Now, when you have somebody with diffuse beta on the EEG, with a lot of beta on the EEG, first thing you have to um, ask is if they're taking any benzodiazepines, chlorazepam, diazepam, any, any, any benzodiazepine will increase the alpha in the EEG. Even if you do a one-channel recording at CC, for example, and you see the beta is going crazy, you have to ask, are you taking benzos? If the answer is no, that's natural fast beta rhythm, which is hyperarousal, hypervigilance, right? Which probably means it's diffuse. Diffuse means it's everywhere in the brain. It's all throughout the cortex. And that thalamus and the, you know, the corticothalamic loop is just giving a crazy output, right? So this is one case, okay? Now, here's a, uh, and here's, a, here's the diffuse fast alpha. This is the fast beta in the spectral analysis. Don't worry, we'll take a look at it into detail. <laughs> and that's the topographies, fast alpha, the beta and the fast beta. And that's what Loretta looks like. So we'll do, an, uh, we'll do a thorough analysis and we'll get to any of those things. We'll reverse engineering and we'll dissect it, okay? Now here's a different one, look at that. So this is a male with emotional abuse neglect. And he's got theta at FZ, which is the limbic output, and he's got a lot of slow alpha. So you would go theta and slow alpha with trauma? Isn't it supposed to be theta if there's hypervigilance? So one thing is what the literature tells you, another thing is what the research tells you, and then a completely different thing is what the real world tells you. Because you, when you do research, and I, I know many of you are interested in doing research, you will contract variables. But the lab is not the real world. So this will break those traditional psychological conventions and schemas that we keep about trauma. So in your mind, you go excessive slow alpha and theta on, on, on the trauma patient. Well, it does happen. Okay. And this is this is a client who is a 35-year-old engineer very smart guy, very educated guy. But he, the emotional neglect was from the, um, emotional abuse was from, on his father's side. His dad was very abusive to him psychologically. And the neglect was from the mom. His mom was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And talking about the orienting response, you know what the slow alpha is? From smoking marijuana. So the very thing that traumatized him, he's orienting to. But why is, he, why is he smoking marijuana? Because he's self-medicating. It's a form of dissociation. It helps, it, it helps him dissociate. It helps him escape the pain. It helps, him, it, it helps him from having to endure all the time the memories and the, 
and the, and the thoughts and the images and the dreams. Okay. So, and when you know when I normally see a, a slow off like that, I go, mm, I'm going to ask, are you smoking marijuana? A lot of people do. It's, it's a form of self medication. So, uh, some people don't. Slow alpha could also mean liver problems or thyroid. So if you see very slow alpha, you have to suspect a thyroid problem, you have to suspect there's a liver problem, or you have to suspect there's um, marijuana consumption. Okay. So organic plus behavioral psychology. And that's, that's the um, slow alpha right there, and the fast alpha right there. So 10 to uh, 8 to 12 hertz alpha. Look at his anterior cingulate gyres. All the rumination going on. It's a very active cingulate gyrus. So the hypervigilance on this guy. No wonder he has. No wonder he self-medicates with my one. And he says he helps me sleep better. Helps me relax. Now, do we want that for him? Of course not, because my one is not as harmless as we think it is. And and, and people make it out to be. You know, so because uh, the. the the pay he's going to price for is this. He's going to his peak alpha frequency, which is an indicator of intelligence, by drop. So why do you want him? Will make you stupid. It will, it will cause your IQ to decrease with chronic use. And for somebody as successful as him, we don't want to do that. Now look at this. Female victim of domestic violence. This is an eyes open recording at the posterior cortex, PZ. And PZ... It's very important for several reasons. Because this is your self-regulation hub. This is where you learn to self-regulate. So if you're anxious, this is the part of the brain that allows you to relax. If you're unmotivated, this is the part of the brain that helps you get motivated. So if you have hyper-arousal, you relax. If you're hypo-aroused, then you act. Okay? And when we look at the, um, uh, something called the background rhythm, and the background rhythm is the alpha background rhythm in the back of the head, which is an indicator of how easy a person can relax. So if you have very little alpha, like this is the case, we have tons of beta, no alpha back there, it is this hyper arousal, hyper vigilance. So if I tell this client, I want you to stress out. They go, no problem. I can do that. And they go into stress very quickly. But if you tell this lady, okay, I want you to relax. She goes, how do you do that? Uh, how is it done? I don't know. I really don't know how to relax. So stressing out is a skill for them. They, they're really adept at it. They're really good. But relaxing is a different story. And it's because that hub is compromised. So we can do some PZ training. Now, if they close the eyes and the alpha doesn't go up and it stays like that, you know there's a, there's a problem with the thalamus because the thalamus is the one that fires the alpha. So the thalamus is dormant for some reason and it's not helping the person relax. So the deep parts of the brain and the cortex are not communicating. The brain is not talking to itself. It's fighting with itself. Okay? And... Um, We'll talk about you later. Now, this is intrauterine trauma. So this is a, a female who is adopted. She was given up for adoption. She don't know who her biological parents are. And she's really traumatized by it. Because she's always saying, what did I do wrong? Was I an, was I an ugly baby? Uh, why did my parents give me away? I mean, that's something that's haunting her to this day. So look at that. We got new rhythm. And we'll talk about the new rhythm specifically. She's got ADD symptoms. So if we were to go by traditional convention DSM-4, DSM-5, well, yeah, she's going to meet the criteria. I think we all do to some degree, right? But if we look at the neuronal substrates, well, that's, that's a different story there. And she has problems with behavioral inhibition, meaning she's quick to react, very aggressive, very, very unrelated and oppositional defined characteristics. Now, one thing that I want to mention, because I think it's very important to mention it now, is that I don't, I don't do diagnosis. Whenever I, whenever I write a report, 
I don't do I don't write specific label. What do I mean by that? I don't write it's depression, it's ADD, it's anxiety. I don't write anything like that. When I when I'm providing the interpretation for the client, 